Hey everyone, and welcome back to ID Anthro. Now I'm super pleased today to have a really good friend and colleague, Claire Bennett, with me for this episode. So Claire, welcome along. Thank you, thanks for having me. No worries. Now, Claire and I first met quite a few years ago, five years ago or yeah, so, yeah. and at this time I was working at Logan City Council, and Claire came in on secondment for a few months, mm -hmm. because you know, you've got a few things going on in your life, so you work for a large consulting firm, yep. um, but you also are involved with a startup called Mackinum that yes. we'll come back to, but at the time, uh, you came into Logan City Council on secondment into our flooding team as my supervisor mm -hmm. at the time. And at that point in time, like for me, flooding was something that I knew a bit about, but it's not well and, well and truly in my wheelhouse, right? Because you know, anyone who watches this knows that I'm more kind of stormwater quality side of things rather than right. quantity. I'm very good at that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was in this flooding team at the time and it was challenging because I was quite out of my depth. And at that point in time, you came in and I found working for you as a team leader really good. And I didn't really understand what it was at the time, but I was like, wow, like this is, this is great to work with and for Claire. And then, you know, you finished that secondment. We kind of lost touch for a few years, three or four years in mm. the middle there, and then recently got back in touch. And on that day, you said something to me that it explained a lot about my experience in Logan at the time. And yeah. you made a comment to me, which was, Despite the fact that, you know, you are first and foremost trained as an engineer and you have like a skill set in flooding and this sort of thing, that you see your biggest strength in a team as the ability to help other people to do their best work. And that really hit me at that moment. I was like, that might explain an awful lot about why I found it so good working for you because I suspect and explains a few things that you did to kind of try and give me opportunities at the time like you introduced me to a bunch of people and I was like oh I think that was you putting that into play <laughs> and I want to know more this about my devious plan at the time. yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> you're manipulating me <laughs> influencing, influencing yeah of course um but I was like okay that seems like it worked for me so I want to understand a little bit more about how you go and do that because I suspect there's some tips and techniques to pick up here. So in the same way that uh, if you're watching this, you might have seen last week us do an episode with Alan Hoban looking at his techniques of how to investigate a site that he's never been to before for a job. In a similar vein today, Claire and I are going to have a chat about this helping people to be the best that they can in teams. So I suppose to kick this up, uh, the question that I suppose want to throw at you was, were you deliberately trying to do that? <laughs> for me when we're at Logan? Or is this yeah. a coincidence that I've missed the... Well, I, I think a bit of both. So uh, thank you, because it's really great <laughs> to hear people say that they that that I've been helpful with that, because that's what I enjoy doing. And that, that feedback is my happiest day. Okay. You know, that's cool. my happiest point cool, of the day. Cool. Um, so that's really lovely. And back then, I don't think I was doing it consciously. Ah. So I... In the last few years, I've been looking more into that and okay. I, it came out of me trying to help people in my teams and finding out, okay, what is their personality type and what do they enjoy doing and how can I help them best? And of course, that always gives you more insight into yourself. And I came across more information about how I operate best. And when I look back on situations like that, I realized that's what I was doing. Okay. So I was doing it naturally, but now I have a name for it. You know, I have that I'm, you know, um, I'm really good at supporting people in, in my teams. Okay. And I know a little bit more about how to do it on purpose. And that's helpful to know how to do it on purpose for people that you might not necessarily get along with immediately. Okay. So I got along with you quite immediately. Sure. We, we had a few things in common around our values and, and that was, it was, so it was quite easy to do that sort of work with you. And that's what I naturally do. But I find now that I know a bit more about how I operate like that, it's easier to do with people that you don't have that immediate connection with. Okay. So it's more valuable. So you mentioned the term on purpose. <laughs> what, does, what does that kind of mean? Um, so I think for me, I'm really good at helping turn value in people through to action. So converting the value that I see in different people in teams into act actions that help a company or help the, the world, um, the environment. Um, and that 
I do now with purpose and I'm okay. more conscious of it. Is that what you meant by Yeah, no, just the, just the term on purpose. It sounded like something that you'd yeah, thought through, but I didn't quite understand the nuance underneath it. Okay, yeah. so what, so you've come to this realization. Was there a particular, like, was it a gradual realization that you came to, or was there a tipping point where you're like, oh, wow, did something in particular happen that you were like, I, oh, I think I'm doing this or I'm not or... Yeah, um, maybe the tipping point was the flip side of it, which is, can be a negative, which is that often your value isn't as obvious if you're in this kind of role. Mm. So my tipping point, if you will, came at a point where I was having, I, so I work in um, a consulting firm, an engineering consulting firm, and I was having a real struggle um, in a team that I was in and I realised it's because I wasn't being valued for what I was doing at the time mostly because I wasn't putting forward what my value was. So as soon as I switch that around and put forward what I enjoy doing and what I can bring to a team okay. um, and recognize that, okay. it was much easier for me to work in teams that so, so were that, natural. So by put forward, you literally mean like you're going into this team environment and like flagging it with people and saying, I think I can bring you this. Is that what you mean by um, that? Or? or possibly more looking for opportunities that were more aligned to what my skill set is. So yeah. if, there, we've, if we were working on a project and there was an opportunity to pull together a specialist team that needed to really deal with an issue that was a problem for a client, um, I would put my hand up for it and say, I'm, I'm really, I really like pulling together teams. Can okay. I select a few people that I think would be really good at that? And can I spearhead this initiative okay. and I wouldn't necessarily um, develop the strategy for what that would be I would adopt that from someone else the, the issue might have been identified by someone else but I would be the one that would um, select the team that would solve it okay. and then work with that team and motivate and encourage the okay. team so that that was my tipping point it was a, it was the the flip side of it which was it can be seen as a negative um, I really thought, oh, that's what it is that I do and I can communicate this to people now and make it a positive. Okay. And how do people, um, how do people generally react to it? Because we had a little bit of a talk the other week about how, yeah, this, mm. it's traditionally, particularly in this kind of engineering or <laughs> technical space, like we value the person who's the, you know, the expert flood modeler or yeah. the expert water quality guy or, you know, whatever it is. And, but I, I just have this gut feeling, but it's, that it's actually the intangible stuff that's not as obvious that mm. actually sets people apart who get good outcomes. So again, reflecting back on that on the previous episode, which I know you haven't seen, but like going out not yet. with, with Alan. Yeah, of course you're <laughs> going to watch it. Um, <laughs> but going out with Alan, because I've always had this thing where like Al gets good results and can see, see problems from different angles. And he's a really smart guy, but I, it feels to me like there's something intangible in what mm. he does, which is why I was like, well, let's take you out on site and try and explore what yeah. goes on. And I kind let's of bottle feel, this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Effectively, I'm trying to bottle it. Um, so, and again, I think that applies in this space, right? Mm. This skill of trying to help people to be their best. It's easy to recognise that. Oh, yeah, that person's great at flood modelling. Mm. Is it? And it is easy to recognise when a team's working really well, but harder to put your finger on. Like in say, oh, the good flood modeler did this. They defined yes. their catchment. There's they did that. They did that. And there's deliverables. Yeah. Yeah. So I think with with someone who's operating well in a leadership role, and there's lots of different people. I'm one type of. I, you know, I've defined what I like doing in a, in a leadership role, but there's lots of different types of leadership, and the often the output of those teams, so a team operating efficiently together and effectively is not really identified until it starts to fall apart. So if one of those people is taken away, if, um, yeah, so it's when it starts to go off the rails that they realise, oh, that was working really well in the past because of X, Y, Z. Or it's really great things like, you know, operating at a profit all the time if you're in a consulting firm or um, if you're in a not-for-profit, um, having real social impact that's measurable. So there are, it's often the higher level indicators so of your company's values and and missions that you're achieving that indicate that okay that kind of skill set is being well applied yes but it's yeah so it's not spotting you, yeah you're not necessarily seeing not the skill set itself yeah. but it's the bigger it's yeah. how it's combined together is the indication that this skill set is probably working yeah. underneath 
Okay. And that's generally harder when you're in when you're starting out in a field in a new field or particular I mean we're talking about the engineering space this technical space in in technical spaces I think you often need to do the work in the, in the technical space and you know I, I call it you know um, paying paying your time in a way yep. not because I didn't enjoy it but because it it was um, something that wasn't ideal for what I was doing so I did a lot of numerical modeling and and spent years doing that and getting good at it so that I could talk in that language with the people that I was wanting to help um, yep. deliver those packages of work. Yeah, so you're saying you need a, like a core level of competency in... Well, I'm not saying everyone does, but I did. That's, okay. that's the path I, I took. I tend to mm. feel the same way though. So I've been thinking recently about, um, you know, the world is becoming more and more digital. I was like, oh, well actually, a really good example of this would be when I was in the flooding team. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I'm not, I'm doing, I'm still doing water quality stuff in this team, but I'm also doing like, I'm evidently in a flooding team. I need to know enough about stormwater quantity and how it flows to at least be able to hold down a sensible conversation mm. with the person who is the true specialist in this space. And then again, more recently, I've been thinking, oh, you know, well, it's becoming more digital. Do I need to understand enough about like computer coding or something yeah. to be able to hold down a conversation? Not actually to be able to write anything myself mm. because that would require a large investment of time that would take away from other things that I want to do. But do I need to learn just enough about it so I can hold a, a salient conversation with someone? Yes. And then, ad yeah. you know, advance. And it's interesting in that space, uh, like you know, one of the biggest ones in Australia, Atlassian, they, um, I've seen in interviews that they, they do, this is a similar kind of thing, they're talking about the basic requirement for the next generations to have coding language. So mm. it's as if we need to learn, so we've got English down pat, <laughs> we need to add to that toolkit of of abilities to communicate and one of them will be coding in the future yeah um, so and they're looking at new ways of teaching the next generations of doing that through schools and tapes and and um, making sure that we've got that skill set to go into this new digital economy that's already exists but well it's an interesting stronger. and it's an interesting one too about how you would make that decision of where to focus because at least in that space and I realize we're suddenly getting off on a real <laughs> tangent but at least in that space digital is uh, relevant to everything so yeah it's of course <laughs> I know it's relevant to your um to Mackinum and your startup so um if, yeah but it's interesting because it's still evolving so quickly it's akin to like you've got to make the decision of what elements of it do I learn such that I don't learn some specialty that's then out of touch very soon. It's like, it's as if you were choosing to learn a language, but the world was still growing five new languages every <laughs> year. So your choice to learn yeah. French mm. might be a bit silly because suddenly something else is going to yeah. pop up. Um, but that's it. Okay. So coming back to, you've identified that you find the skill set of helping people to be very fulfilling and mm -hmm. something that you feel that you're good at and you enjoy this opportunity to bring together teams. Can we get down to kind of uh, some of the tangible actions of you do that? So you've got a team together and so you might have a collection of different disciplines. So mm -hmm. what would be, what might be a typical um, mix of disciplines that you might regularly work with? Yeah, so often I'll be working on large infrastructure projects. You might have someone from a geotechnical field, water resources obviously, um, you might have a civil and you might even have someone from a, sort of a pavements group or a, or a um, transport group. So that's one classic one. In, in other projects that I work on um, at Mackinac, for example, we have content writers, reviewers, uh, we have contractors, creatives, creative directors. Okay. Um, so you, um, um, maybe a more varied um, set of skills in that space okay. as well. Okay, so you've got a team together. Let's let's talk in the more the infrastructure field because that's yep. probably more relevant to this audience. Mm -hmm. um, you've got this team, it's coming together. What, like, what tangibly do you do to help that team gel or to help the individuals excel in that team is this yeah is there things that you are like going okay i want to do that then that and that is there a recipe or? I, I don't think no i I'll, I'll steal from alan i don't think there is a recipe okay um i for me anyway and maybe i will in you know with some more experience in this field i might say there is a recipe but um i looking back looking back on people like you that have come back and said wow i really enjoyed working with you because of xyz um, i've had a few people say that and i realize 
that I was giving, there's a key theme, which was listening to what the person was wanting to do at the time and finding a way for them to do it in their current role. Um, and, that, and then once they're doing it in their current role, finding a way, a pathway for them to do some, something else if they, if they don't want to be in that role. Ah, so this sounds like career growth yeah. and career progression. And okay. really the fundamental element of it is listening to the people in your team. Okay. So I think that's missed often because you're under pressure to deliver. Um, you often just say, well, this is your role on the team and that's what you need to do. But the, the kind of strange part of it is that if you get someone doing something interesting that they really enjoy, they'll do the bits that on the project that they need to do yep. more enjoyably and more happily. And um, so if you encourage them and support them and motivate them in what they're passionate about and then also give them the tools to do what they just have to do in the meantime, yep. that works really well. And this this possibly ties into uh, this connection between like how we create new ideas. So, and I'm no expert in this, but as I understand it, like neuroscience is beginning to show us that obviously the conscious mind is very good at problem solving. So you go, these are the things that we know, thinking like knitting through, okay, how does this like, how do they fit together? Really trying to like consciously problem solve stuff. Mm -hmm. But then that the subconscious has this potentially extra creativity and extra processing power to link together distinct ideas. It mm. feels to me like there might be a, so this is why like people are like, oh, I have all my best ideas in the shower. Yes. Right, because you've been thinking That's about- That's because of water. I would say. But, <laughs> yeah. but so you've been thinking about it all day, really consciously trying to um, figure it out. And then you go to the shower and that's the moment you turn on the tap and you switch and your conscious brain switches off mm. for a second. And suddenly your subconscious takes over heaps of processing power and goes whack, yeah. that connects right there. It strikes me that there might be something similar going on here where if you're, so like, yeah, so the absolutely. new ideas come, mm. at, like, come at like the connections of different things. So the subconscious can pull together. You were deliberately working on that, but then there was this other thing over here that you hadn't quite figured and it pulls it together. It strikes me that by supporting someone with, you know, their role in the team is to mod model the flooding, but they're also really interested in this other thing mm. over here, that by letting them, helping them to pursue that other thing and making them real, like helping them to be really happy and inspired in doing that, that that potentially then brings value back to the I think team. So. Yeah. so in a way that you wouldn't have got if you were just like, hey, look, your role is to model the flooding. Yeah. I'd really love you if you Sit went down, and did that. Do that really fast and yeah, whack it don't out. talk to anyone else. <laughs> and yeah, so I, I think, yeah, you're right. The brain's amazing. And um, one thing that I like the idea of is seeding. So okay. seeding the brain with ideas. And okay. it's that kind of conscious versus subconscious thinking. And so if you, if you're working on something that's challenging, whether you like it or not, if you get all the information together that you can um, at the time, and then, okay, read, read over the documents, um, research it, and then go away and do something else. So yep. go for a walk, uh, go for a bike ride, that kind of thing, come back to it, provide a bit more information, that's the seeding bit. Yep. So just have a chat with someone about it. Yep. Um, and I'm sure you're doing this a lot in your work. Um, you'll have a chat with someone about it. right now. <laughs> <laughs> and then you go away and you have a think about it or you watch some more things, um, do something else that takes your mind off it and come back seated again. And it's a process. Um, but if you've got the time, and you can speed up the process and you can be really conscious of doing that process. Um, but if, if you've got that, that generally results in really good creative solutions, um, innovative solutions, I suppose. And that's, I, I like doing that process with people as well. Um, having the conversation, listening to what they're talking about, what their problems are, um, throwing out either an idea that they might not have thought about or a person that they could go and talk to, mm -hmm. um, depending on the people, because, or it might be a website that they might want to go visit if, you, if it's more of an introverted person who doesn't want to have a conversation yep. directly. Um, so providing a, a resource, seeding people with resources, um, and then letting that idea and solution evolve. Yeah, mm. I think, and I think that ties in well with, uh, I personally feel like I've derived a lot of benefit from listening to podcasts. And I think it's mm. for that sort of yeah. reason. And I speak to lots of people who just love this whole podcasting phenomenon because you're getting a whole bunch of different perspectives. <laughs> a little bit of it, yeah, to be perfectly honest. Um, Although it's also a really good excuse then to come out and have chats like these, <laughs> right? So, um, because, let, but let's think about this. So obviously you and I have had chats like this and that's cool. But again, reflecting back on the episode filmed recently with Alan, 
I can't think of a reason. Like I learnt heaps from the process of going and filming with Alan. Mm -hmm. But I can't think of a reason where I would have otherwise said to him, hey, can we look, meet up on site and I'm going to quest question you for the next like hour mm. about why you're looking at that thing. That's a bit socially weird to <laughs> do that. So, oh, so I've got to admit, I am definitely getting stuff out of filming this. Okay. It is absolutely a good excuse mm. for me. Um, and if we can film it and share it, all the better, right? Mm. So uh, where were we going with that? Um, podcasting, yeah, the seeding of ideas. So... I've certainly found that exposing myself to lots and lots of different ideas, which again, if, you, if I thought about this logically in the first instance, I'd be like, well, why is listening to a interview, I mean, I was listening to one the other day, an interview with a UFC fighters coach, mm -hmm. right? Why, why would I initially think that would help Seems me as a, a stormwater engine? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then you start to be like, oh, I just thought a few things that he said about how they approach, for example, um, they've got a fight coming up, they know who the opponent is and how they work through, you know, figuring out how that opponent moves, what their habits are, yeah. breaking that down. It's not that dissimilar to you coming to a engineering project and going, oh, what's the, you know, where does, like, what are the inputs? What are the variables that we're deal dealing with? The opponent is the variable in the fight and the natural environment is our variable in a project and in both cases we have to go and understand them assess them learn something from it and then decide how we implement yes. um, yep. definitely the strategy is still the same yeah 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 the process for sure okay mm. so you're uh you're bringing you know teams coming together you're finding ways to seed seed ideas with people are there other other approaches or other i, I think that... having the right team is um really important too and fostering a, um, a culture in the team. Okay. So, um, and that often does come down to the types of people that you're including. Um, okay. So developing trust in the team, um, having vulnerability amongst the team members. Um, so someone being able to say, I'm not really sure what I'm doing or, and, and not be threatened by bringing that up um, and having the rest of the team help them solve it. Okay. Um, so selecting the right team members, the people that have the right skills for what you need mm -hmm. to do, um, the people that have the right level of commitment and, and, and being willing to say, you're not in the right team, let's move it away. Not because you've necessarily made a mistake or because you're not good enough for what we want to do, but because you would be really well suited over here. Um, and that's when I think working along across several teams really helps because you can identify um, what someone might want to be interested in and then help them get across to that area which in turn helps the team that they were in because you mm, make an opening right. for someone who's getting um, the right more mix. suited okay so so that so that last part there the helping people find like being their right team and mm -hmm. sounds tangible you mentioned a few things along the way like building trust and encouraging vulnerability that sound really good you're like oh yeah we mm. should want to you know want to have a trusting team mm. so that people feel like they can express themselves but how do we do that yeah. and i get that this is possible uh, this <laughs> is a really challenging question so yeah. well it, it is and it isn't i think both the trust and and vulnerability they're both about to some degree taking risks okay. so trust is about um a person who is relying on someone else so okay. often a team leader or a manager um, giving the opportunity for someone to do something outside of the scope of what it is or you know to to trust that they will do their work within a certain amount of time is a very basic one but to trust that they will um, work on the project and finish it and deliver it instead of moving to another company is a is a different level of trust um, so how do we build how do we build that though because well, I, I, I imagine it's not that's yeah i imagine it's not is, walking in and saying yeah. i want us all to trust each other <laughs> the risk that you take at the start is and you do it small in small steps is to give people opportunities to do what they would like to do okay. um and so the opportunity is provided and the risk is that they may not deliver what mm -hmm. you would like them to deliver or need them to deliver um and if they don't deliver then they know that they've eroded that certain level okay. of trust and if they do deliver they've built trust so you start small because you don't want to risk it all on a big project and say I'm just going to give you six weeks to finish this project and I'm going to hope that at the end of that six weeks you've done it okay. and that's my yep. risk you would start smaller and say well you know I'm going to send you to this meeting can you represent our team 
um, come back to me and have a chat about how it went. And that's an opportunity for someone who's more junior to go along and, and, and do that by themselves. Mm. And when they come back with the sense of achievement, they've developed trust and they've developed their self-confidence, which is another element to trust. I like, okay, I like, I like the sound of this starting small thing. Cause this yeah. And then you build it and then it's, it becomes entrenched. Yeah, because what that, the connection that I made as you said that was, uh, you know, so for people watching who might not know, I've, you know, had a past life competing in a sport called bike trials, where you ride a bike over obstacles and stuff. And people will come up and they'll see me riding or see me training and you're jumping over big stuff and they'll be like, wow, how did you learn, learn to do that? Start small. Exactly. You start small. My response is always, well, it's just like anything else, you just practice lots. I started trying to ride my bike up the gutter outside <laughs> my house. And then once I could do the garter, I found something that was that much bigger yeah. and built up from that. And that's exactly the same. I gave myself enough of a challenge with enough risk attached to it at the time that it was like pushing me, but not scaring me off so much mm. that I just wasn't going to go there or that I was going to screw up and really hurt myself, yeah. which is the, akin to what you describe here. You're giving someone enough like... You might get a scraped knee, but you're not going to break your leg. Yeah, exactly. And then once, yeah, once the person's then gone you've done well at that then the next time you can push it a little further yeah. and a little further yeah. okay and it works both ways that that trust equation works both ways so okay. they need to trust you and that's kind of where the vulnerability element comes in so if your team members feel like they can be vulnerable with you then and you when they are vulnerable with you you um, support and encourage and help move through that and create self-confidence then that fosters trust as well so they know that they can come to you and say I'm having trouble with this and they know they can come to you on small things and they know if they're doing that throughout the process starting small and working out big they can come to you before it gets to be a big problem yeah and they can come and say look I thought I had this underhand uh, in hand I thought I was gonna or underhanded if to yeah. be <laughs> doing, um, thought I had this in hand um, but it turns out I'm not gonna be able to get this deliverable out and instead of waiting until the last hour they'll come to you a week beforehand so you can actually fix it because you know you because you've shown the trust on your side of the equation in the past when they've come to you with small issues and you've supported and helped them through those issues rather than saying well thanks for nothing you're out yeah so um, but but through that process of the trust, vulnerability, opportunity, all that sort of stuff, you will identify in those small steps if a person is suited to the role or not. And you either change the role to suit the person or you help the person find another role. Yep. And that's only going to make them more happy. Yeah. And they're only going to deliver better. So yeah, which it, is, yeah, which is a good thing for them. Yeah. And if you find out early in the piece, instead of having it snowball, then it's a lot easier to deal with. Yeah. This, so this is kind of, uh, yeah, this is getting into this space of just like constant and open yeah, communication. communication. It's mm. it's uh, it's like being in a relationship, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, okay. And all I mean, all the things that we're talking about are relationships. I think uh, oftentimes I work in this, you know, consulting, working with clients. People joke that they're going out on a date with a client. It it is developing a relationship and dating is our society's way of recognizing that and labeling that but it's like making a friend mm. um, or starting if you've ever started at a new workplace and you're making friends it's the same kind of thing we just have different relationships we have colleagues we have friends we have partners it's it's all relationships it's yeah. all about humans yeah for sure okay so so we've got a few uh, we've got a few tidbits here so we've got uh, helping people to be able to pursue their passions. We've got fostering. If they know what they are first. <laughs> okay, so helping them identify them as yeah, well. Yeah, so what if they don't know what? So, so like when we met, I imagine it was probably fairly clear that I was red hot <laughs> into stormwater quality stuff. That was fairly you, you obvious. Were easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but let's say you've got someone who's, you know, wanting to do good work but is a little bit less clear. Mm. Does the approach change? Uh, the initial approach doesn't. I think whenever you come into a new team, and it's interesting coming into a new team that's already established, or um, which is quite common. It's very rare that you get to start and build a team and finish that project and then move on to another one and start a brand new team and build it and move through. Most of them are partially developed already or um, developed by someone else and then you inherit them. Mm -hmm. um, so the first the start of that process, the, the, I think the people that I see doing that really well are the ones that listen to each of the individuals 
and then listen to the group as a whole. And that's through conversations. Um, and I'm really good in that heat of the moment where you're just having conversations um, and translating that into actions okay. later on, um, not forgetting about that kind of those elements. So you identify each of those different people, what they're interested in, and usually you'll find that some people are really passionate about something and really know what they want to do because they've either um, found something that they've enjoyed working on in the past or haven't found it yet and they, they think they want to try out a new area. With the people that aren't so sure, it's usually pretty obvious if they're just not very happy in what they're doing. Um, and you, but once again, each individual is different. You explore why they aren't happy in that. Okay. Is it because of the environment they're working in? Is it because of the work that they're doing? Um, and even just changing one element of that, once again, starting small, will help them feel better about what it is they're doing. And yeah, because it I've does... I've had that experience throughout my career, so I understand that feeling. Yeah, because it's like, even if the situation is still challenging for that person, the change from a very challenging situation to a challenging but you know not as challenging situation is a positive move yeah, so it's going to generate right. a good feeling and it creates there. that kind of process in your brain that we were talking about earlier which is um, it sort of opens up more capacity for you to think about what it is that you would like to do yep. so if you're not under stress and it is actually being under stress and having cortisol coursing through your body um, if you're not under stress in a situation that's not pleasant and you take part of that away you open up more capacity to brain power to think about what it is that you actually want to do yeah mm. yeah so you mentioned and okay so we don't have to go here if this isn't related but you mentioned just before we went on camera that you've recently been doing a counseling course is yeah that, yeah so, so I'm volunteering yeah yeah okay so is that something it seems to me like that might whether that's directly related to this space or whether it's something but at the very least it seems like something that might be like you might be picking stuff up in that space that is interesting for building team environments and helping people. Is that mm. is this is this anything in that that's happening for I, you I think, at the moment? Um, or so the the process. I'm working for a volunteer organisation in the healthcare space, okay. and um, I'm doing a certificate for in counselling okay. through that. So um, you go through the process of of I, it's it's a lot around language and how to communicate okay. with um, people that are requiring counselling. And the reason that I got into that was I've just come off parental leave, 18 months of parental leave. Mm -hmm. And having just had a baby, I felt very vulnerable at the time when you've just had a baby. <laughs> and in, do you mean in general or in coming back into the workplace? Um, or? Just, just in, when I had the baby, okay. so immediately after. It's okay. a very, um, as a human, you feel very vulnerable. You're relying on other people. Okay. <laughs> and um, so that's the space that I'm doing counselling in for new mums okay. um, through this volunteer organisation. And that I found really, um, really valuable to put a structure to counselling because it identifies how you communicate with people in that space. And that, that's an intense level of vulnerability and, and um, need, um, but you can translate that to lots of other areas where you are feeling um, exposed at work or if you feel like you're doing a calculation and you can't um, make it work, you can't make it do what you are expecting it to do or you um, don't know how to finish the, yep. solve the problem. Um, so that's a, that's a level of vulnerability too. And the language is very similar. So you're dealing with someone who's feeling um, stressed or um, uncomfortable. Uncomfortable is probably a really good word. Okay, mm. so, this, so this strikes me as a little bit like and I love just kind of full analogies from different spaces of life, but people say in technology development or like car technology development or something, mm. talk about how the often the next, you know, the, the big advances, the advance in the braking systems, this sort of stuff comes from racing. Like so Formula One, because it's pushing the very limits of That's that right, sport, the extremes. develops something yeah. new and eventually it, it trickles down in some form into the average consumer car. It sounds like a parallel mm. here yeah. to this like counselling in <laughs> yeah counselling for you know new mums new parents might be a particularly heightened aspect of that mm. and then maybe back in the can workplace be. for some people it's lovely it's not necessary sure. okay but yes it can and be and I'm well yeah. out of my depth there right <laughs> so um, but yeah so it seems to me like that's a spot where you uh, are pushing yourself to learn new techniques and then you're going yeah. how does that trickle back down into this other 
space. So is yeah. there a tangible example of some of one thing in particular that you've learnt there or is this more um, just generally? I think it's probably um, focusing the, the other keywords that come up in this space a lot are empathy um, and listening. So okay. in all the things that I've been talking about, it's about listening, listening to the Listening is a theme here, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, so um, you can't, I don't, I don't think you can help someone unless you listen to them. And I, I think every, it's, listening is like important for everyone. Yeah, so, um, so a lot of what um, that process is, is teaching me and um, developing is the ability to listen find out what it is that that person is struggling with because you don't want to shoot off down on a tangent about what you think they might need um, mm. and they won't find that valuable or even in that um, place of vulnerability not even not finding it valuable but just finding it worse than no help at all <laughs> yeah. so who is this person yeah. who's trying Why to support are they me saying that? Yeah. yeah so it, it's about i think identify uh, listening um, hearing what they're saying reflecting it back to them, empathizing, um, and not necessarily providing solutions, but helping them come to their own solution. Mm, okay. Because that's the most powerful um, conclusion that someone can have is that they want to do something themselves. Yeah, and this, yeah, this could be a... And it's a, empowering. That's absolutely. the other. So empathy, empowering, I think is... And this could be a little bit of a trap for many of us, and I think for me, and definitely working in... A professional sphere where like generally we are paid to come up with solutions and be like oh, that's the Very answer black and white. yeah so if you're then attempting to help someone in their you know work within a team or something it might be very tempting for you know you in trying to help that person to go well i think you should do this but what i'm what i heard from you was it's actually way more powerful just to you know make the space for that person to come to whatever conclusion, conclusion it is themselves. Yeah. yeah, you don't necessarily have to, or maybe even you shouldn't be giving them the answer because that won't actually, mm. in the short term, it might look like you've been amazing for them, but it's maybe not going to stick as well, perhaps. Yeah. I'm bumbling through that. <laughs> no, I think you. I think that's that's a good summary of it. Okay, mm. cool. Well, look, why don't we, why don't we call it there? I've really mm. enjoyed this. Is there anything, or is there something that's on you? Are you like, no, 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 we need to, I've, I just no, want to say no, to that, that little good. bit. We got to the empowering bit. I think um, that was the, the final message or the final thing for me is when someone comes back to me and says, I feel so much more confident in doing this work or I feel empowered or um, just happy working in a team. That to me is job done. Yeah, that gets you. We can, we can that leaves you satisfied and happy yeah. with with the job done. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Look, thank you very much for the chat. I really, thank you, Jack. I really enjoyed it. I'm really glad that you made the time on this Saturday morning to come down and stand in a park Beautiful and talk. Place so, to stand, so yeah, sweet. Okay, cool. Thank you also for tuning in to this episode of ID Answer. I hope that you found it interesting. If you want to know more about what it is that we do, if you have any questions, so I really encourage people. If you've watched the episode and you're like, I wish I knew more about that. For sure, ask a question. You can find our contact details online at www.idanswer.com. Shoot us an email. There's also a little questionnaire form, uh, like a submit a question form, so you can you can ask us stuff if you would like to. I love it because I love this kind of discussion and interaction. So in the same way I enjoyed this chat with Claire, <laughs> I enjoy the chat when people you know email me email me and go, hey, what about that? So by all means, get in contact. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Sweet. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. And we'll see you later. Bye.